he was like a really educated, super charismatic, your typical sociopath type of a person who could have just pulled one on anybody. He, he was really friendly, really charming, super handsome. I ended up in my childhood being tortured for the better part of it. It was 13 straight years of abuse and I ended up getting out and escaping when I was 19 years old. And from there, it, you know, most people love that story where you escape from abuse and then it's like, oh, everything's gonna be perfect. But the story that they don't tell you is that that's when the real work starts. The public eyes are starting to open to the idea that this kind of stuff does actually go on. So I feel like we're actually more ready than ever before. I really actually regret in my own career stepping out with the truth about my childhood because what I noticed happening is instead of the focus being on my content and you know, wow, this person's coming from such pain, let's look at what she did to heal. The emphasis went straight to me as a person, whether I'm telling the truth or whether I'm lying. The focus went totally to the details of the abuse, and it was like the content that I was sharing was lost. When I was about I'd say eight years old, he ended up sewing me into a body and leaving me there for about 12 hours. And because the body was in rigor mortis, his penis was completely erect. So he also had me perform like sex with this body. And so I'm having sex with this corpse and he's getting off on it. Like by this point, he had taken the knife and taken a huge slice of this guy's leg off of his, of his thigh muscle and was just chewing on it because he was cannibalistic as well. So he was chewing on this this raw, he, he, was, he never cooked it by the way, he was into raw stuff. I was not prepared for how unready people would be for that. I watched them actually kill children. And that's when we really got into the human sacrifice thing, which is what most people want to interview me about, you know, because that's like so abhorrent and most people can't even imagine that going on. I was totally naive to the fact that when people listen to these things, these stories about abuse, they're not ready to accept it as reality. at this point, but we can't deal with something like ritual trauma, even though it's a reality in our world today. It's a reality that a lot of people are facing, but one that most of us in greater society doesn't want to actually acknowledge is real. It makes us too uncomfortable. I'm going to stand on the side of the abuser, in fact, and say that this didn't happen. And it's probably the worst thing you could do to an abuse survivor. There are lots of other truths as well that I shared in the beginning of my career that people are not ready for. People are not ready to talk about extraterrestrials. They're not ready to talk about uh, details of reincarnation. A lot of the issues that people have with my timeline happens because they are stuck in the paradigm of how abuse has to look.
It was just like, I need to go on a trip, which was not allowed. The, the last time I'd gone on a trip, he actually killed my dog. So I became totally obsessed with modeling, got into it. Most of the money that I was making out of modeling, I was giving right back to my keeper. Very upstanding, super charismatic leader type personality. Most of the people in, in the society that we were living in saw him as a very, uh, let's say, cutting edge type of a person because he was into the alternative field. What really happens with abuse is a double life, and it's this double life that people need to understand. Because that is how this abuse occurs. And, and if you understand that, then you understand how somebody could be going through the type of things that I went through and also going to school. The father was taking pornographic photographs of the daughter and I in, in his little basement area. Now, this is, it's like, he likes sadomasochistic porn. So the father then put the blood over us and then kept taking pictures of us kissing each other and touching each other, things like that. He was coming into my room in the middle of the night, taking me out of my bed and putting me back before the morning. He would keep me in the basement or in this hole that he had outside, which was a three foot by four foot hole. I watched them actually kill children. One of his favorite things to do is to chase me through the woods. When I was down in that basement, I had no idea whether he was going to do me in or not. I would, I would sit there for hours sometimes hearing his footsteps in the house above, wondering whether today he was going to come down and you know, cut my arms off with a knife or a chainsaw. How many children did you watch him kill? I can remember, well, him specifically, not the group five. So you, you physically watched him kill five. Oh. How many did the group did you witness? Probably seven over the course of my life, I think. Yeah. He would grab them and like brutally beat them to death, or in one occasion he had them to death with a small like axe. But they ended up doing a ritual with her and then they just picked her up and put her right down over the top of the fire. So I'm sitting next to this body which was missing its entire bottom jaw because it was a suicide victim. He had me like carving ritual symbols into the body. You know, he made me carve the body up with ritual symbols and made me actually have sex with this body, which was really a nightmare. He would sit me somewhere like in a, in a cave overnight, leave me there, totally terrorized, traumatized. So what do you see hanging from the rafters? I shrugged my shoulders, he goes, you see that that's your mother? You see that she's missing her skin? Someone has taken it all off of her body because you said something. Do you see that her blood is all over the floor? Go touch it. Thing. Do you see that her blood is all over the floor? Go touch it. Our society is so desensitized to horror films that I saw an ad for a horror film and unlike people who watch that for fun, that was my reality. So I know exactly what it feels like to be kept in a cage and have somebody, you know, be threatening to cut your arms off. By the time I got out of childhood, it was, it would have been probably 15 or 16 therapists. Oh, I was in and out of hospitals, and 
in a psychology offices every other 10 seconds. And the people who know what they're looking at are like, this is super not okay. You know, the fact that this girl for the last 20 minutes has been trying to perfect the exact same like pirouette turn on belly shoes and can't smile type of things. They drug me off the hobby bike, took me into this, this steakhouse and then pushed me down to the ground on my face and I was raped by him. And I was really torn up, I was bleeding. I was prostituted to men out of outdoor gas station bathrooms. I was being prostituted out to men out of outdoor gas station bathrooms and sometimes motel rooms. He would take me either into the motel room or into the bathroom and have their way. He used to prostitute me when I was younger. The guy would come in and then he'd do whatever the hell he wanted to, rape or have me you know, perform fellatio. Stuff like that. I mean, I'd probably see, like, the most I ever saw in a night was eight. Usually it was like two or three. I could focus on the fact that my ribs felt like they were breaking because this man was on top of me, or I could focus on how I liked the pattern in the carpet he was raping me on top of. You know, a lot of more into the asphyxiation. I liked those clients, to be honest. I mean, it sounds really horrific because I would almost die. I, got, I was actually impregnated three times by, and then aborted by him. Yeah, he impregnated them and then, and then performed the, all of the abortions with rudimentary veterinary equipment, which did a hell of a lot of damage. Because I didn't do it, he threw me down on the floor and then he stepped on both of my arms and actually uh, ended up hairline fracturing. He cut coup into my ribcage, meaning take a knife and, and cut lines in my ribcage or else rape me the one. So if he caught me, I would get punished. Like my rib cage is covered in these, these scars. I have slits in my rib cage from each time that he won essentially those tracking games. And rape was also a part of that, but I didn't mind that as much as being like, you know, having a knife drawn across my rib cage. Like ritually bled a lot. They do that where they cut you and they bleed you over a sink or they cut you and bleed you over some sort of a ritual item like a chalice. So I'd get hooked up to electrical currents. He used with, he used, uh, like electroshocks. They were putting these white pads with a little gel underneath them all over my body and then they turn on the electroshocks. So you get traumatized. I pissed myself. It's like being electrocuted is pretty much the most unbearable thing you can imagine. You're stuck down there for hours and hours naked. You have nothing else to keep you company. You're freezing cold most of the time, laying on a bed of stinging nettle. He'd been drugging me out since I was six years old on ketamine. He had access to ketamine, dormitory, and xylosine. So all three of those drugs were used on me like a lot throughout my childhood. At that point, I was actually hooked on, on, on a ketamine that you could drop on the pulse points of your skin. He used to hog tie my ankles and arms together and then put me down inside this hole. And I had no idea how long I'd be down there. So I had no idea whether he would kill me afterwards. And one of the things that my, my particular perpetrator used to do all the time was to keep me in these, these bird ties that were like, um, sort of like horse hobble. He would hog tie me with my wrists to my ankles and I'd spend days that way sometimes and he wouldn't feed me. But this one time it was like probably 11 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the workday. And he took me out of the back of his truck and put me hogtied in this parking lot with tons of people around. I mean, like tons. It was lunch hour. There was a group of three women at this particular point who were walking into the subway station store right by there. They passed me. All of them watched me hogtied on the floor. And they looked at him, and they looked at me, and they looked at him, and looked at me, and then they just kept walking. And it's very possible for that to happen under the noses of individuals in people's lives. Now, if it is perfectly possible for somebody to get straight A's and to have this entire other reality where they're getting tortured. I graduated from high school at 16 years old with straight A's and early bird scholarships.
you know what, I'd have these pseudo-seizures, they call it. It's like an epileptic seizure, but it happens when the brain is has been traumatized so bad that the memory of it makes it shut down completely. So you, you'll see me convulse, basically. They put me on a Bilify, for example, and for whatever reason, it made me puke blood for about two straight weeks. And when we called the therapist saying that this is what was happening, he said, just keep taking it. If I felt the pain, my brain had already decided that pain means I can't escape, so go away. So I believed my hand on the stove for like two minutes and it began to completely burn. I was driven up to southern Idaho. He took me out of the car. At age 19, during what Teal calls a ritual in eastern Idaho, He had found out that I was planning on potentially leaving to, it was an escape basically, he planned, I was planning on escaping. He ended up finding that out, I don't know how he did, but he found out. I had hinted at the idea to my mother who ended up telling this guy, not knowing of course that he was going to do it, anything like that, but I hinted that I wanted to leave with this guy that I was dating. It was this deaf guy, I'd been with him for two years, I was really in love with him. And we were gonna move to, you know, Colorado, which was not gonna be possible because of how heavily programmed I was anyways. But I mentioned it and it made him so upset and so mad because we are not allowed to leave. You know, we've got callback pro programs like crazy to go home. I had planned to get away from him for just a little bit to go do some modeling. I was not planning on running away. I'll just let go there right now and tell you. I didn't think I'd ever be gone. So. It was just like, I need to go on a trip, which was not allowed. The, the last time I'd gone on a trip, he actually killed my dog. So I planned on going on this, this trip. He found out, caught wind from my mother, and he had planned the scenario because he was super furious. So I get back from a trip, and he injected me with ketamine. Somewhere inside me, I had this impulse to, to run away from the group. I wasn't planning on leaving permanently. It was just an impulse. I was talking about running away, mm -hmm. which is not permissible, but I wasn't talking about that to the group, I was talking about that to my mother. My mother didn't know that Doc was part of this, ended up admitting to him that I was talking about moving out of state, and it infuriated him. and threw me in the back of this car that he had and then drove me up into the wilderness. And when he put me in the back of this van that I was in, I was conscious the entire time I was there. When he injected me and put me in the back of this van, I didn't lose consciousness. I was driven up to Southern Idaho. He took me out of the car. So he, he took me out to the middle of these woods, got me out of the truck. I got in my car super drugged out, which I don't even know how the car got there. I'm assuming he had another person drive it there, but by the time I got down to his house, my car was there, and he's like, all right, well, you better monitor yourself, you know? And so I got back in my car, and I could not think of what to do. And the only place which felt safe to me was to drive three hours from his house to 
Blake's house. And my car had ended up being driven, probably by somebody who he knew, to the house. And he gave me the keys and said, look, the cops are going to be after you, so you had better stay real close, girl. And I wasn't really thinking about it. I'm like, well, I should just drive away. So I get down to the base of this trail after this whole scenario was over, and my car was there. He had had somebody drive it there. I got into the car, and I drove, and I didn't go home. I drove, like, three hours to Salt Lake City, where I had met a boy who actually still works with me today, which is why this is such a cool sort of turnaround. I, I got in my car super drugged out. I could not think of what to do. And the only place which felt safe to me was to drive three hours from his house to Blake's house. So one night when I was completely drugged by him, I got in a car and I ran away. And I ran to the home of a man that I'd met only twice. I got in the car super drugged up still, and I drove all the way through the night to the home of a man that I'd met only twice. That summer, he ended up targeting me. I was walking, not walking, I was riding my little huffy bike sort of down below my house in a Mormon steakhouse building parking lot. I was in a role that the cult group calls the Oracle. It's basically like a direct channel from source consciousness, and we are, we are essentially raised to become what they call the Pythia, which is the top female position within, a, within the cult group. And that's a very large group. It's, it's not rural. It's intended to basically be handed up all the way to the top. <laughs> that's their goal. Their goal is to raise one of these Oracles to become the Pythia. So when I was younger, I would put my hands on people and they'd experience healings or I would talk to them from the standpoint of their dead relatives, stuff like that. They believe, essentially, like most of the Mormons, like the Mormons believe, I should say, that the powers of priesthood, like the ability to lay your hands on someone and heal them, or your ability to give blessings, things like that, the powers of priesthood come directly from God to Joseph Smith to men. And the group that I got taken by this cult believes that if a woman exhibits these abilities, then it's a gift of the devil. So when I came to this, this religious town, because my parents were forest rangers and got a job there, um, they ended up, I, I had all these abilities, that's how I was born. So I was the kind of kid who would walk over and lay my hands on people and heal them, and I was the kind of person who was talking about being able to hear what other people were thinking and talk to dead people. So they, because of my abilities, they believed that, well, Mormon Church believes that priesthood, these powers that I came in with can only come directly from men, or God, sorry, to Joseph Smith and men. And so the fact that I was a woman, made it so that these abilities had to be a gift to the devil.
you've never once during this interview named your perpetrator, mm -hmm. your keeper. I I've named him in the police reports. Here's the issue, and this was like this, this was explained to me like very explicitly by the police, both the police department and by like separate attorneys and people that if I name the perpetrator publicly, mm -hmm. basically without the trial going through, sure. Right now, not only does that flush the pheasants, what that means is that basically it gives them an opportunity to stash evidence, but also um, I can be sued for defamation of character. In the first few years, I was hiding like that. I just wanted, I wanted nothing to do with anything, and it was like paranoia 24 hours a day. And after a week, I didn't ever want to go back. A po týdnu jsem se nechtěla už vrátit. So I really started hiding. So it started turning into fear of going back, and then I just hid. At first, I hid, I hid like crazy. I didn't tell anybody. In the beginning, I was hiding, right? And I didn't want anyone to know. I mean, if you, if you look at my driver's license, it'll send you to a police department. Like I didn't want anyone to know where I was at all. I was scared to be in the state but couldn't leave the state because of programming to not leave the state, right? I had escaped with a pair of jeans I was raped in. I had escaped with a human tooth that I took from a sacrifice. And I wasn't planning on doing this, I might add. If you walked in and you said, look, somebody is getting killed in a backyard right now, they're lucky. You are lucky if they send cops. And if those people say, no, you can't come in, then they have to have probable cause for a search warrant. attorney made the executive decision to keep the case cold where basically it's it's not like it's closed it's open but it's waiting for further evidence or waiting for further people to come forward that my case went cold basically run as fast as you can to run to the first place if you can find a police department that's even better <laughs> She referred me actually to this woman who works in the town, who um, is a rape crisis, or not a rape crisis, um, she's a trauma expert in ritual abuse. That's kind of upsetting, I mean, like, all of us need to stop here for a minute and realize, like, if somebody can make their living and, like, honestly has to have patients referred to her, this is how over overflowed she is with clients, if that can be a specialty, does that tell you how many people in this particular area are suffering from this particular condition? I was allowed to go into group therapy where I got to meet other women and I will never forget the day that I first walked in and it was a group of I think like five or six women and the one who was sitting right over to my left side when I walked through the door both of us started crying because she and I had met each other at a, at a satanic mass.
Like, I didn't want anyone to know where I was at all. I was scared to be in the state, but couldn't leave the state because of programming to not leave the state, right? Where is your keeper now? I have no idea. Like the guy that I was with, basically, you're dealing with a psychopath who is crossed over and is now killing people. And when you have spent time around these people, you find out something very quickly. And that's that the only point at which these people get found is when they want to get found. And they will get riskier and riskier and riskier and start placing bodies closer and closer and start doing things where the level of risk of being found is higher and higher because they want someone to stop them. How did you not fall victim to being a sacrifice? I have no idea. I would love to. I would love to tell you that I know exactly why. So she brought me over to that house, and the first time that I played with that girl at her house on her own um, was when I found out that her father was actually part of a satanic cult. At what point did you realize that you were in a satanic cult? Um. I, I, well, that's the thing. I feel like I didn't realize that until after I got away because they don't refer to themselves as satanic. They call themselves the Order of the Brotherhood of the Beast. I kind of had this flip happen in me because I, I started, I, at first I wanted nothing to do with my abilities either. I was in professional sports, that's what I wanted to do, just anything that would get me grounded in the physical and I don't want anything to do with this kind of ethereal crap. So I was in massive resistance to that. started off my career thinking was that by sharing the truth about my past, people would see that as a credential for why to listen to this person. He belonged to two cults. One cult was that satanic cult, the other cult was the blood covenant cult.
these covens of like 13 usually because they believe in 13 silver moons in a year and there's 13 full moons so it's usually 13 members of a satanic coven. It's like some part of us is set free when those women come forward and we're like, oh, thank God. But another part of us is intensely jealous. It was the most interesting reaction I watched in myself to the Elizabeth Smart case because I was just like, first of all, I was so angry because of the amount of money she had, mm -hmm. you know. That's the only reason anyone gave a shit that she disappeared. Right. Let's just be honest. Because, I mean, if you're like a little little foster kid, no one's going to put your face anywhere. You're not going to be in multiple states, much less you're lucky to be in one city, like on, on a gas station window or mm -hmm. something. So on one hand, I was like, I was like, yes, thank God, so, like, you know, this stuff is in the public news. On the other side, I was like, you know, I hate her. I hate her because there's so much attention. I hate her because she's glorified. I hate her because you know, the reality for her is now that she's got her umpteenth book is that people are, you know, that she's releasing this kind of major, is that she's set for the rest of her life because people know about it and the majority of us are like struggling, I mean really struggling. Most people don't understand, for example, why uh, somebody like Elizabeth Smart could be walking around in the streets, right? Let's, let's go with Elizabeth Smart because this is a good example. This is somebody who was ritually abused, right? So, but she was unusually, in an unusual setting, completely removed from the family. That's not normal. That's less normal. And the reason that it raised so much awareness publicly versus just being a girl who disappeared is because her daddy was rich. Watch these videos applying each one to the specific jealousy or envy you are feeling. The first is how to find a core belief. The second is meaning the self-destruct button. And the third is how to change a belief. As a therapist, and now 11 years trying to get over it, <laughs> this old paradigm of the fact that you're just damaged because the rest of your life is not. They're damaged for life. They're damaged for life. <laughs> Let's face it, I've been through, I can tell you there's a lot of things that are worse than death. So, um, having personally experienced what it's like to be unable to escape and to be physically tortured and emotionally tortured, I don't care whether someone shoots me. I don't care whether I die. So they knew I was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. They just didn't know what was causing it. Now, in retrospect, it's obvious to them what was causing it. But in the middle of it, you know, their explanation now is we it just we it did not even cross our mind that that was possible. They believe something happened because it's undeniable, but they don't believe all of my story.
What makes these types of people so dangerous is they've been isolated for so long. Even if they are around people, they're isolated, trust me. They've been isolated for so long that they don't really have much to lose by getting rid of relationships. So they can pull moves that other people can't pull. So you will lose against this person, like quite literally, when it comes to any kind of a, a tactical approach, because they're not looking to get along. That's what I understand about them. That's why conscious manipulation is basically your best strategy with these types of people. They don't want to have a good relationship with you. They don't give a shit. Literally. They care about winning, and they care about them, their own um, identity. I had a huge issue, which is still a huge issue today, which is my sense of belonging. I had no sense of belonging. I wanted to belong with her really badly, but her father and her family had this thing about family time. So this one day we were totally in love with each other, just like having so much fun together. And of course they pulled one of theirs, it's a family night, and so Teal has to go away type of routines, which crushed my heart. So um, I was really wild as a kid, like completely wild. And so I decided to hatch a plan. So what happened is that um, we decided to exact revenge because they were sending me home. So <laughs> we waited until everyone went to sleep and we were in her grandmother's house. And then we went crazy. We switched every single spice in her cupboard for other spices. We took out the pepper and we melted all of the vanilla ice cream. You know how vanilla ice cream has those little black specks? We poured pepper all through it and then refroze it because she eats that every day. She wakes up with oatmeal every day too. And we were so mad that we took bird seed and put it all through the oatmeal. Um, we switched out chocolate sauce for soy sauce. We switched toothpaste for lotion. We hid her dentures. What else did we do? But like, I mean, we the whole fucking night was spent just completely wreaking havoc on the house. And we got in serious trouble the next day when, of course, her father was like in the middle of, of the afternoon was eating the ice cream with her and realized that we had done that. He didn't get us in trouble immediately right there in that moment, but we got in some serious trouble for that. But yeah, that's a funny story from childhood. <laughs> will use his ability to, to fool you as proof of his own grandiose, grandiose omnipotence, omniscience, and narcissism. And the problem with that is that you, you can be fooled, and virtually anybody can. So that Robert Hare, for example, who for a long time and interviewed a lot of them, like hundreds of them, and videotaped many of the interviews, he said when he was talking, about it, he always believed what they were saying. And then he'd watch the video afterwards and see where the conversation went off the rails. But, you know, the, pro pro the proclivity to be polite in a conversation is very strong. And if you're polite, you don't object to the way that the person unfolds their strategy, you know. And I'm pretty good at figuring out how to manipulate, obviously, how to manipulate people. And the probability that you will be immune to that is extraordinarily low. I wanted to be honest.